Uh, good morning and welcome to this, the 15th meeting of 2014 of the European External Relations Committee. Can I make the usual request that mobile phones are switched off and uh, some members are, are using iPads. Um, can I extend uh, apologies from Hans Ala Malik and welcome Patricia Ferguson to the committee. Welcome back um, to the committee as, as a substitute. The uh, first agenda item this morning is the Brussels Bulletin. Um, we have um, quite a comprehensive Brussels Bulletin in your pack if you want to have a look at it. Um, the, the clerks uh, have put together um, a very detailed analysis of the transatlantic um, uh, investment in Trade and Investment Partnership, um, commonly known as TTIP, um, because it was something that we wanted to have a look at, and it goes into quite some detail. But I'm happy to take any questions, comments, or queries about the Brussels Bulletin. Rod. Um, thank you, Convener. I just wanted to make reference to the consultation on Year 220 and whether we as a committee were going to engage and possibly put forward uh, a response to that consultation um, or whether we're going to invite the Scottish Government to do so. I'm just uh, having a wee whisper in my ear. We've got some scheduled work to do in August, so we're discussing how we're, we're going to focus on that and, and take that forward in the committee. Um, so the meeting we have in August will, will probably okay. be the place Thanks to do that. Yep. Okay. Jamie? Um, just in relation to the TTIP, um, I've certainly had a few constituents write to me um, about it, um, and, and it could obviously have a fairly large impact on businesses in Scotland if the trade barriers with the US are, are removed. Um, I don't know whether we want to... I mean, I'm looking for answers there, really, uh, and, and as to, to what, what it would mean. Um, uh, that's all I can say. I mean, I, I, you know, I'd like to know more. I mean, it's still at the, the implications. Really, it's still at the consultation stage of it, but the, the reason why um, we had agreed before to do a wee bit more uh, detail on this was because that very reason that people had been writing to members and um, to, to me as, as convener as well, um, looking for some uh, information on how we would handle that. I think one of the things that we could do is write to the Scottish Government and ask them how their uh, Prog the progress in, in negotiating in any conversations that are going on and how that will then affect Scotland. But I think you're absolutely right, Jamie. I uh, attended a hustings with the NFU and a number of the farmers there raised really serious concerns about um, provenance and quality of beef uh, and other products, you know, maybe coming from other parts of the world and not um, maintaining the same standards that the EU requires. So there's, there's real questions in there about what, what does it mean? What does it mean for, for farmers and, and others? on the ground. Yeah. So, no, I think you're absolutely right. Okay. But we could, if, if committees minded, we could write to the Scottish Government and ask them um, where they are in the process and what their plans are for... for and that, that then gives a committee locus to then look at it, yeah. Uh, and perhaps what the, the supposed implications might be. Could, could we ask for that? Indeed. Indeed. Okay. Is there any other comments about... Willie? Thanks, Convener. Let's uh, turn into the Brussels door. <coughs> Bulletin, if that's OK. Um, there's two items that struck me there as worthy of mention. I think first is um, access to finance for small businesses on page nine there. Uh, members will note that under the EU Capital Requirements Directive that actually came in force in January this year, small businesses have got a right to, to get feedback from their banks about loan applications and so on and so forth. Uh, you, you might think that's an obvious thing, but it's, it's not actually happening widespread in practice, as it seems. It also appears that when, when small businesses make loan applications like this, very often the assessment is done using data pools, large, large data pools, which are kind of corporate-based assessment tools, rather than localised decision-making. So what this might do, convener, if the, if the Commission can beef this up, is to allow small businesses to interact with their banks more locally. When they're, when they're discussing loan applications, and I think that can only be a helpful step in understanding and perhaps persuading banks to make more localised decisions for small businesses in, in Scotland and, and in Europe in particular. Um, the other point that I thought was of, of interest to me and, and my own interest is the digital skills um, agenda. Again, you'll note that the, the bulletin reports that Europe's telling us that there's about 700,000 unfilled ICT related jobs expected to be within the Union about, by about 2015. Most of them, I would imagine, 
might be in software engineering. And as you know from discussions in the Scottish Parliament, there's quite a dearth and a shortage of software engineers within Scotland, and that seems to be reflected through Europe. And in fact, 60% of those, those vacancies it's reporting are in the UK, Germany, Italy and France. So the initiatives that we've seen in Scotland recently to try to address that, to, to encourage more youngsters to take software engineering, and particularly women as well, I think are to be welcomed. And I think it's a welcome step to, to note that the European Union itself is, is concerned about this and is prepared to do something about it. Okay, thank you, Claire. Um, a, a couple of points. I'll pick up on the, on, on the ICT one, which I had also taken a keen interest in. Obviously, um, Mr Cothy and I both have a background in IT, particular interest in these areas. Um, I was wondering, though, if um, it says that the Institute have produced a, a map <coughs> of, of the ICT areas, and I wonder if the clerks could either find us a link to that or um, if we could maybe get it lodged in SPICE so that members have an opportunity to go and look at it. I think that would be very, very useful. Um, and I echo everything Willie has said about the digital skills, but also was um, quite taken with the Blue in Innovation section about marine, um, the strategy for um, the marine areas and given Scotland's um, waters and, and the amount of interest that this will be, to put in particular interest in Scotland, I thought that was an area that we may be able to come back to in, in a future committee to look at in more detail. Okay, Rod. Uh, just uh, another point in terms of the EU capital requirements legislation. Um, the UK's legal challenge to that, could we just ask uh, for some kind of update if, if there is any on when the Court of Justice is like to be hearing this challenge? Anything else? No? Happy to forward the Brussels Bulletin to our subject committees. Should we raise with economy and finance the specific points that you raised, Mr Coffey, about finance? I think that would be very, very helpful to, to alert them to, to that. Just to... Okay. That's that. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, moving on to our second agenda item today. Yeah, we're going to just um, suspend very, very briefly to allow people to get to their seats and get things set up. So, suspend briefly. Okay, and welcome back to the European External Relations Committee. And as I said, we're moving on to agenda item two, which is the um, Scottish Government's proposal for independent Scotland international policy, including membership of international organisations. This is our main uh, agenda item for today. Um, and we'll be taking just this one off evidence session, which is in the form of a round table, as you can see. Um, a, apologies from David Pratt, who can no longer uh, be with us today. He has another commitment. Um, as I say, we'll be running this as a round table format. Um, if people just catch my eye, if they want to come in, you know, if you want to comment on each other's comments, if you want to come in to answer some of the questions from members, please just do that. But if you can maybe do it one at a, one at a time through, through me, and then we'll maybe make some sense of it. Um, as I say, just, just catch my eye. What we'll do first, um, uh, because we've got Alison Bales, who is with us from Iceland on the, um, <laughs> on the video conferencing monitor today. Uh, so... What I want to do is go around the table and uh, for everyone to introduce themselves um, and just where you're from, if, if you're happy to do that. So I'm Christina McKelvey, the convener of the European External Relations Committee. Uh, Claire Adamson, Central Scotland MSP. Uh, Colin Fleming from the Scottish Centre of Constitutional Change, Edinburgh. Good morning, Alison. I'm Wally Coffey, MSP member for Kilmarnock in Irvine Valley. Jo John Ainsley, coordinator of Scottish Campaign for Nuclear Disarmament. Patricia Ferguson, MSP for Glasgow Media Hill and Springburn. Juliet Carbo, Senior Lecturer in Politics and International Relations at the University of Edinburgh. I'm 
My name is Alec Rowley, um, constituency MP, MSP for Cowdenbeath. I'm Roderick Campbell, MSP for North East Fife. And I'm Bruce Adamson, the Legal Officer at the Scottish Human Rights Commission. Uh, Adam Tompkins, I teach Constitutional Law at Glasgow University. Jamie McGregor, MSP Highlands and Islands. Alison. Yes, I'm Alison Bales, teaching at the University of Iceland in Reykjavik. Welcome, uh, welcome uh, everyone to committee today. As I say, we've got um, uh, quite a, a, a good topic to, to, to get stuck into today. Um, and, and really, as, a, as an opening question, I would probably um, you know, ask uh, our witnesses today to give us a wee bit of their insight into uh, where they think Scotland's standing is in the world and you know, how, how that's developed and how we can, we can take it forward. It's just a very gentle opener, and then we can go to the more specific. Um, Bruce. Thank you, Convener. Um, I mean, along with the White Paper, the, the Scottish Government has made commitments through, through Scotland's National Action Plan, which, which set out very clearly um, the, Scotland's relationship um, and international obligations. And the, the Scottish Government um, and previous Scottish Governments have, have committed to ensuring that, that human rights considerations are at the heart of the international framework that, that Scotland connects to through international development, through bilateral engagement, and through engaging with, with intergovernmental organisations. And international human rights law lays out obligations which, which states are bound to respect. And by becoming party to the, the international treaties, which Scotland has through the UK, um, states assume obligations and duties to, to respect human rights by refraining from, from interfering or curtailing them, to protect individuals and groups against human rights abuses, and to fulfil human rights by, by taking positive actions. And these obligations to, to respect, protect and fulfil flow, th flow through all of international policy. And, and that's a really good place to be starting when we consider Scotland's relationship with all intergovernmental organisations. Um, the Scottish Human Rights Commission is the National Human Rights Institution for Scotland does not take a view on, on the outcome of the independence referendum. That's a matter for the, the people of Scotland. Um, but now is a really good time to reflect on, on Scotland's place in the world and where we want to be in, in the future. Um, and while foreign affairs is currently reserved, um, observing and implementing international obligations isn't. And we've made some, some really good progress over, over, over recent years. Um, and I think one of the points I would like to make is, is, that, is that you, as members of the Scottish Parliament, share that obligation, um, play a very key role as, as part of the state architecture in implementing and observing human rights. Um, and, and I think that's something that, that I'd, I'd like to, to develop in terms of the role in which um, the Scottish Parliament can play in the future in um, intergovernmental organisations. And that there's some areas where, where Scotland's really already leading the way and, and playing a, a key role in developing international standards um, on business and human rights, on climate justice, um, and, and particularly kind of relevant at the moment, our approach to the Commonwealth Games, where for the, the first time there's going to be a human rights policy in relation to, to the Commonwealth Games and the, the, the National Action Plan, which I mentioned at the start, which has already received um, uh, international praise for the approach that we've taken. But there's, there's a lot more that we need to do as well. There's, there's some real gaps. Um, the, the reticence to, to incorporate um, international obligations and sometimes where our engagement with the international community has, has um, raised some, some serious concerns. The, Things like the, the age of criminal responsibility, the, the lack of equal protection for children from, from violence. Um, this international framework provides us a really good starting point um, for, for these, these further discussions. So I think what I want to, to, to say and what, what, what the, the Commission wants to flow through this is this respect, protect, fulfil flows through all of our international obligations. Okay, thank, thanks very much. Bruce, any other comments from our witnesses on? No, I've got a follow-up question for, for you then. Um, uh, you, I don't know if you're aware, uh, Bruce, of the paper produced by the House of Commons European Scrutiny Committee, the application of the EU Charter of Fundamental Rights in the EU UK, a state of confusion, which I have to say I wasn't very confused when I read it, but I was very uh, worried when I read it because um, words like disapplication of any human rights responsibilities have been used. Uh, whether that's where the recommendations will go, I'm not sure. Um, but I'm a wee bit uh, worried about how the, the impact that would then have on our human rights charter and how we then take that forward. 
Um, I, I think that the, the key point when looking at our in, international obligations is they, is they, they flow, flow through everything that, that we do and that um, we can, can start looking at the UN and the Council of Europe um, and the, the European Union and, and the, the Charter of Fundamental Rights. But I think there's political decisions to be made in terms of where Scotland fits in in the world. But what isn't a decision is our commitment to the international standards of, of, of human rights. Um, Obviously, the, the committee has, has, has spent um, a significant amount of time and take, taken um, evidence on the EU, and including the, the Charter of Fundamental Rights, and that, to, to some extent, has been dealt with, with separately. But the Commission's approach is to say that the starting point is, is these, these human rights principles, and, and they, they, they flow through. Um, the Charter of Fundamental Rights reflects international standards that are reflected in a, in a whole whole range of international treaties that the, the UK and, and Scotland are already party to. Um, and the way in which we engage with, with the EU and the Council of Europe and, and other international bodies needs to, to flow from those, those obligations and how they apply in Scotland. And it's much more about how human rights are, are, are brought home and apply in the day-to-day -day lives of, of people than the political decisions we need to take about, about how we, we fit into some of these, these structures. Yeah, thank, thanks very much, Chris. Tompkins. Um, yeah, thank you, Gavina. I just, I just wanted to say about... I mean, I haven't read the specific report of the um, European Scrutiny Committee that you just... Um, uh, referred to, but I will um, uh, very shortly. Um, now you've made me aware of it. I think that the um, anxiety um, uh, that's shared across um, uh, both of the main Westminster parties um, uh, in uh, British politics about human rights is not about anything that Bruce has been talking about, and I agree with everything, I think, that, Br that, that Bruce has said. Um, uh, that will s soon stop in order to make this interesting. Um, <laughs> but the, the anxiety is, is not about the UK's or Scotland's commitments to international human rights standards. The anxiety is about the role of European courts in, um, uh, in, 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 in particular the extent to which the two European courts, the European Court of Human Rights in Strasbourg and the European Court of Justice in Luxembourg, um, seem able um, uh, to... Uh, dictate to the United Kingdom um, aspects of domestic law which go um, considerably further than the human rights standards that the United Kingdom signed up to when it ratified the relevant treaties, the European Convention on Human Rights in 19, which dates in 1950, the Treaty of Rome, uh, the Lisbon Treaty uh, on, on the EU side. And this anxiety, I think, is felt equally strongly north of the border. I mean, you find Scottish judges uh, privately concerned with this in the same way that you find English judges privately concerned with this. You, there was a huge political storm a few years ago um, about um, uh, certain uh, European, European rulings concerning um, aspects of Scots' uh, criminal justice procedure. Um, uh, and you see elements of that also in the ongoing uh, political arguments here about corroboration and reform of criminal justice. So um, I, I think that I would make a distinction between um, uh, both the United Kingdom's and Scotland's commitment to human rights standards, on the one hand, uh, and an anxiety which I think is felt um, very strongly in British politics, but also um, here in Scottish politics, an anxiety about the, uh, about the role, uh, about how far the role of European courts and European judges in the two European courts has extended to limit the um, room for manoeuvre, the margin of appreciation, as it's sometimes called, that, um, domestic, that elected politicians ought to be able to have in assessing in the public interest um, how you um, uh, distinguish between, how you legislate for the distinction between um, uh, the necessary protection of fundamental individual rights on the one hand and the public interest uh, on the other. Courts in the UK, both north and south of the border, are... <coughs> Uh, in crude terms, more deferential to political judgments, both in this parliament and in the United Kingdom parliament, than uh, European courts have been. And that's where the cause for concern, um, I, I think, is. Whether the specific report of the European Scrutiny Committee in the Commons that you referred to talks about that issue or not, I, I don't know. But that seems to me to be an important distinction to bear in mind. OK, thank you very much. Did, did you want to come back? <laughs> Uh, only very briefly to, to probably agree with Adam and that we're going to disagree <laughs> and that, we, that we'll oh, okay. disagree on, um, on the, the way in which justiciability of, of, of human rights is, is important. And, and I think that the starting point here is, is to realise that um, 
that the human rights treaties aren't aspirational, aspirational documents kind of dreamed up. These are carefully negotiated treaties with, with international, um, international effect and international law. And um, I would kind of disagree, I think, in terms of how the, the, the courts have, have extended, um, extended rights in that we have a, a framework of um, international human rights obligations and they've been negotiated kind of very clearly and they are they're universal and that you can't kind of separate or put a priority in, into rights. And, and one of the um, issues of conflict seems to be where um, there is a difference of opinion in terms of how far kind of court should go. But, but courts are very much setting the kind of the, the floor, the very minimum standards. And where the, the application of human rights really is, is, is the application and, and moving progressively to realize economic and social rights. And, and the court's role is, is to make sure that we don't fall below that, below that, that minimum standard. But I, but I think there's a real danger in seeing um, uh, human rights as some kind of, um, kind of ceiling, um, because I think that, that gets us into a very confused position. Thank you very much. I'm happy to open out uh, to wider uh, topics if uh, colleagues are ready to go. Jamie, of course you can. Just on that subject, um, the, 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 this business bit of the sort of um, <coughs> differences between in, 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 individual rights, individual human rights, and what is public interest, what's deemed to be public interest, how the, 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 in the European courts, when they come up with uh, these things on individual human rights, do they not take account of public interest um, but because obviously this is going to come up and be difficult for some governments and countries. Uh, I just want to know how, that's all, how, it, how it comes into being, really. Adam? Um, yeah, well, yes, I mean, the, the answer to that, um, in, in short, is yes. I mean, um, national courts, um, both in Scotland and uh, south of the border, uh, and European courts, both the European Court of Justice and the European Court of Human Rights, certainly take into account um, questions of the public interest. Um, uh, when determining disputes um, on uh, human rights or convention rights grounds. But the argument um, I I in British politics at the moment seems to be, um, you know, uh, in simple terms, uh, a disagreement, I think, between the extent to which um, courts should privilege public interest considerations over individual rights considerations. So a classic example... Um, uh, this parliament legislated to ban the hunting of um, uh, foxes with hounds um, uh, in Scotland. And that, that legislation was challenged on human rights grounds by people who said that their right to property or their right to privacy or their right to a livelihood um, was disproportionately interfered with by that legislation. And the courts looked at that and they said, well, look, you know, um, it, uh, uh, there, there are some uh, individual rights claims here which are material. There are some public interest considerations here which are material. Um, uh, if we look at the, uh, the record, we see that the Scottish Parliament uh, deliberated upon all of these considerations w w with really, you know, quite some uh, uh, detail. And the court was impressed, I think it's fair to say, by the, by the quality of the debate here. Uh, in this parliament uh, and ruled um, that the um, uh, legislation uh, was not a disproportionate interference uh, with, the, with the rights in question. So this, this, is, this is absolutely typical of human rights litigation. Right? There's a challenge uh, to legislation uh, by individuals who claim that the public interest in the name of which the legislation has been passed uh, disproportionately interferes with their convention rights or their human rights and it's the job of the court to assess whether the legislature has, a, has, a, has achieved an appropriate balance or not. Now, in, in that uh, very delicate exercise, which is not clearly an exercise purely of law or of politics, but which is an exercise that involves both legal and political considerations, it seems to me, um, UK courts tend, of course there are exceptions, but UK courts tend to be slightly more deferential to legislative judgments that have been reached by elected policymakers than European courts do. And that is one of the causes of the tension that, it, that we see, uh, both, as I say, both north and south of the border at the moment in terms of, um, in terms of what you might call human rights politics or <coughs> arguments about the reform of the Human Rights Act. Uh, if I can bring the in independence question uh, in, into this, I, I don't think Scottish independence, um, were it to arise, would make very much difference to any of these considerations, other than that they would be more visible in Scotland. Uh, there would be more concern, probably, in Scotland about the way in which this Parliament was being 
constrained in its freedom of maneuver by uh, international human rights lawyers and by European uh, courts using aspects of international human rights law aggressively. Why would it become more visible? Because the range of powers available to this parliament would obviously grow in independence and uh, a number of human rights considerations would come into play uh, in the Scottish legislation here, which are currently uh, reserved, reserved to Westminster. So I think the, I think the problem is it's not a reason for or against independence, not a reason for or against a yes or a no vote. I, just, I, I, I do think that the that Scottish public concern and Scottish political concern about uh, international and European human rights law would be likely to grow rather than diminish. Concern would be likely to grow rather than diminish in the event of independence. Rod Campbell. Uh, I have a couple of points, um, uh, convener. Just uh, in, in terms of uh, uh, a reference in, in Mr Adamson's written submission on the way in which uh, Scottish law policy and practice was being represented at the current time, um, there is reference in that in the footnote to a report to the UN Committee on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights. Um, I think it makes particular reference um, to drawbacks that, of the UK member state submission in relation to housing and health, in particular in Scotland. But that dates back to April 2009. I wondered if uh, uh, Mr Adamson had any kind of more updated thoughts on the way in which um, separate Scottish law in practice was being represented by the UK member state and uh, how he perceives uh, kind of independence might change that. Chris, do you want to come in at this point as well? Then? Uh, yeah, so, so maybe just um, a, a very brief point in terms of our, our kind of concept of, of human rights. And, and obviously, I think as, as, as lawyers, we often focus very much on the justice, just, justiciability of, of human rights. And when we look at the Human Rights Act and the, the Scotland Act and how they've brought um, domestic incorporation of, of some civil and political rights um, with, with, within Scotland, I, th I think um, there's a real danger in, get, in getting too focused on that because I think that it, um, it ignores the the wider obligations that we have. Um, and while um, even within the, the Human Rights Act and the, the rights contained therein, um, those rights aren't, aren't, aren't all absolute. And, 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 and the courts are very good at kind of balancing the, the, um, the, the concepts that, that, um, that Jamie McGregor was talking about in terms of, of finding that kind of proportionality. That, that the courts have got that very well developed. But, but I think there's, there's a real danger in focusing too much on, on those rights that are justiciable and, and forgetting that there's a wide framework of international obligations that, that we need to meet. And we can do those in a whole bunch of very positive ways. And, and there's a lot contained within the National Action Plan about, about meeting the, those obligations. Um, uh, but we, need to, we do need to be very, very clear that, that we ensure the, the protection that's contained within the Human Rights Act. And, and the Scotland Act in terms of the way in which, which legislation is framed, but that, that's not the, the whole story. Um, in relation to the, the, the specific question that, that Roderick Campbell was, was, was um, asking in terms of the way in which particularly um, Scotland is represented through the UK at the international level through the reporting against our international obligations, one of the, the concerns that the, the Commission has raised um, on a number of occasions is that when um, the, the member state or the high contracting party to, to, to a treaty is um, engaging with the international um, mechanisms that, that review those obligations, um, there is a risk that uh, Scotland might not be as well represented in terms of some of the progress that we've made. Um, while the Commission doesn't take a, take a view on, on independence, what I, what, I, what I would say is that there is huge value in ensuring that um, public and civil servants and, um, and other professionals are, are fully um, trained and aware of um, human rights standards and so that they can feed into that, that reporting process. Because what we're talking about here is, is the reporting process to, um, to the, the supervisory bodies. And... Um, I spent um, most of last year at, at the UN office in, in Geneva and um, representing national human rights institutions from um, across the world, over 100 countries, and I engaged very closely with, um, with diplomatic missions and treaty bodies um, from across the world. And what works very, very well is when you have um, very highly trained civil servants, not just in New York and Geneva, um, Strasbourg and Brussels, um, but well-educated and well-engaged domestic 
civil servants who are able to, to feed into that process and to be bought to be bought in. And I think that um, the uh, the, the World Programme for, for Education on, on, on Human Rights is, is, is really key here, is that what we can do and what I hope we will do through the, um, the National Action Plan is to improve the level of education understanding um, of everyone in Scotland and particularly civil servants so that we can um, engage better with that reporting process. Um, thank you, Convener. Um, just before we move on, probably from this topic, I was wondering if you could maybe expand on um, your written evidence and the white paper in, in relation to the um, constitution and a written constitution and um, <clears throat> what opportunity that might give to actually um, embed human rights into that constitution and independent Scotland. Um, yeah, and I, and I think this is probably one of the things where, where um, Adam and I will, will, will quite strongly disagree um, in terms of the place of, of economic, social and cultural rights um, with, within the, the framework um, of constitution. Um, the, the UK and, and Scotland is one of very few countries, my home country, New Zealand and Israel are the only other two countries in the world that don't have a written constitution within a, kind of a, a single, single document. And... Um, and in New Zealand at the moment, they're having the same same discussion and conversation about um, the value of, of having a, a written constitution. Um, and, and I'm told um, <laughs> that, that in Israel they're having that discussion. So, so it, it's a really, really um, interesting time. And, and the Commission's view very strongly is that um, independence of the, the results of, of the referendum in September is that we should be looking about at how we can better incorporate human rights within the constitutional framework, um, and whether that's through through legislation at a devolved level or a national level or, or constitutionally, um, that that's a discussion that we that we should be having. Um, and the thing that that's a decision. What's not a decision is in terms of the the international standards. And I think that we've got really good evidence from across the world that the best way to, to protect human rights and um, the best way to um, fulfill our international obligations is to incorporate those, um, all of those, those rights, including economic and social rights. And we've got the vast majority of the countries in the world now, to some extent, in, incorporate economic social rights within the, a, a, some kind of constitutional framework, and so that's where where we should should be headed, reflecting that that that, that all human rights are, are, are universal and divisible, interdependent and, and interrelated. But the, the commission doesn't take a view on um, whether independence provides um, additional impetus to that or not. But but what the commission is, is very clear about is that we need to have this debate and we need to explore ways in which we can do it, no matter what the result is in September. Can I just... Oh. Uh, Patricia, is it on that? Yeah, Patricia, you, if you come in first, yeah. <laughs> um, I, I must admit, I've always found it uh, intriguing as to how people in Scotland would be better served by having uh, human rights obligations enshrined in a constitution because already they're enshrined in everything we do. You know, this parliament can't pass legislation that isn't compliant. So I, I I'm, would like to just tease out what you think would be additional in you know, the scenario where we were having a written constitution that would enshrine human rights. Well, okay, just on, on a very, very brief, brief point, the, the, the Human Rights in the Scotland Act um, do incorporate um, with, within, within Scotland in a kind of quasi-constitutional way um, the number of rights, the kind of civil and political rights within the, the European Convention as set out in the Human Rights Act. But um, I think what a wider discussion is necessary about the whole range of, of international obligations that aren't currently entrenched in any way in, in domestic law. And so I think that is the discussion that we want to have, is, is about the, the rights wider than the, those rights just contained within the Human Rights Act and referenced in the Scotland Act. What, what, what rights do you have in mind? What wider obligations? 
So uh, uh, economic and, 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 um, and social rights, so the, the kind of broad range of particularly rights um, in, in relation to, I mean, the, there's been very recent discussions in the Parliament about the, the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child, which, which isn't incorporated um, at all, and, and there were some, some discussions about whether we could do that in some way. But the kind of broad range um, of, of economic social rights, the kind of the rights that kind of cut to the, the very heart of um, and of people's kind of daily lives, um, rather than the kind of the civil and political rights which were traditionally kind of protected. But this is kind of kind of housing and the kind of basic thing: housing, education, um, the, the the very kind of basic things that cut to the heart of, of people's daily lives. Professor Tompkins. I've got, uh, thank you very much. I've got, I've, I've got two concerns about what Bruce has said. Um, uh, the first is um, that um, the more you say, ah, that, you, know, you know that thing over there that we like, that's a human right. The more you do that, there are lots of things over there that we like. You know, we like a clean environment. We like air, good air to breathe. We like clean water to drink. And thank you for supplying it. Um, uh, we, you know, we like good education for our children. We like good health care. Um, the more you say all of these good things, which are you know, public policy imperatives, which are you know, the reasons why we elect you to get these things right for us, um, the more you say these things are human rights, the more you risk diluting that concept. Uh, and uh, like Bruce, I believe absolutely passionately in human rights. And I think that there are some rights which are so important that they ought to be absolute rules lines which can never be crossed, um, and the absolute right um, to be free of torture anywhere in the world is one of those that I would say is an absolute right that should not be subject to proportionality analysis, that should not be subject to deference, that should be an absolute, and, and there are probably others, but that's an, that's an example. And, and I, I really worry that um, the um, extremely good, uh, well-intentioned work um, of the uh, Scottish Human Rights um, uh, Council, Commission, Commission. Commission, sorry, Scottish Human Rights Commission, uh, and other like-minded um, organisations um, across um, uh, Europe and indeed in the world risk diluting the core of the concept. Um, uh, um, and and I'm, I'm nervous for that reason about constantly adding to the list of human rights. I mean, how, I mean what is human? A human right is something which we cannot be a human without. Right? If, we are de if we are denied a human right, we are denied something which is of the essence of our humanity, right? Uh, and uh, um, I, I, that's my first concern. The second concern is if you put these economic, social, and cultural rights, the right to um, food, the right to development, the right to health care, the right to social security, that's what we're talking about when we talk about economic and cultural rights. If you put these in a written constitution, or if you put them in an act of parliament, if you put them in any kind of legal instrument, whether you call it a written constitution or not, then um, uh, do these become uh, justiciable? Do these become enforceable um, in a court of law? And would it be the case that in an independent Scotland with a written constitution, including all of these rights that Bruce wants to put in, that this parliament wouldn't actually be responsible for determining you know, how water is supplied to Scots or how uh, we're going to tackle questions of the environment or how um, uh, 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 stretched resources in terms of healthcare are to be appropriately provided. This parliament won't be deciding any of those things. This parliament will be making pitches to the court of session which will be deciding these things because these questions, once they become enshrined, which is a word that Bruce used, once they become embedded in a written constitution or in an act of parliament or in, a, in some kind of legal instrument, become, as it were, the property or the domain of lawyers. Now, you know, I'm a lawyer. I quite like lawyers, but I, I like politicians more. And the reason why I like politicians more is because we elect them to make these decisions for us, and if we don't like the decisions that they make, we can de-elect them. Um, and you can't do that with judges. And that there, there is a real democratic deficit problem with the prospect of enshrining all of these rights uh, in a written constitution or in an act of parliament. It's why the UK has never uh, done it. The UK uh, is, as a, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a polity, absolutely committed to doing the best it possibly can in terms of you know, health care and clean environment. And you may agree or disagree politically with what the UK is doing. But that's exactly the point, isn't it? It's a political disagreement. So why would you want to hand all of that over and give it to the unelected old white men of the court of session uh, to enforce on Scotland's behalf? I just don't understand the democratic logic of that, of, of that, of that position. 
Alec Rowley first and then we'll go back to Bruce and I think we're going to have to move the topic, topic on after that. I, mean, I think it's a, a really interesting discussion regardless of the outcome of the referendum and it's perhaps one that, that, that we should return to because, you know, I mean, I've always believed that it's the right of every individual to have a roof over their head um, and, and strive for that and I'm sure politicians and governments, say all persuasion, um, or, or certainly most, um, would, would strive for that. But it's, it's whether, it's whether that, that put, enshrining that in some kind of written constitution would mean anything to people at the end of the day if the local authority or if the Scottish government or the UK government uh, don't make the financial resources available to prioritise having a roof over your head for every individual in the country. And I think that... That's the interest and what would be the point of it if it doesn't really mean much. But you did say you did say that there is there is evidence um, that the best way to protect human rights is to have a written constitution. And it would be interesting, I think, perhaps to not necessarily today, but to, to get that evidence. Are you saying that in all these countries where there's a written constitution that human rights are better protected? Are you saying that where there's written constitutions and people have rights to housing, rights to health care, rights to that they actually get that more so than, than, than we do where unwritten constitution? I think that would be interesting. But as I say, not necessarily for, for this debate. It's something we should return to certainly after the referendum. Yes. Yeah, I, mean, I, I think that this, this cuts very much the heart and, and very much of, of what we're looking to do through, through the, the, the National Action Plan. And um, as I said before, most countries in the world do incorporate economic social rights, the, the, the kind of housing, health, education, within some kind of kind of legal or constitutional framework. And, and it does provide a high level of protection. Where I, I, I strongly disagree with, with, with Adam is defining human rights simply as those absolute rights. That, that's not what, what human rights are. And that this isn't something that, that's made up by courts. This is something that, that, that is made up by politicians. The, the um, international treaty obligations are carefully negotiated um, at an international level. And following on from the, the, the Universal Declaration of, of Human Rights in, in 1948, which didn't make a distinction between these, the, these rights, um, that, that, that said all of these rights are, are, are indivisible and, and included economic social rights. And following the, the treaties through the, through the 60s and um, with, with the, the International Covenant on, on Economic Social Rights um, and Cultural Rights, we, we've had a, a strong history of political negotiation about defining what these rights are. These aren't new concepts. These are things that have been negotiated at, at a political level. And some, like torture, are absolute. But others need to be progressively realised, taking into account the kind of economic situation in, in a country. And, and courts and other places are, are very good at balancing these rights. We've, we've seen some, some um, very strong jurisprudence from, from South Africa, looking particularly in relation to things like health care, where there were cases where people um, um, coming forward saying, I want a particular type of treatment for, for, for the... the um, the condition that I have, and the court saying, no, no, the, the, the right to health doesn't say that you get the treatment that you want, um, but what, the, the, um, what the, the standards say is that the state has to consider everything. The state has to make a decision based on the available resources to the, to the, the best attainable standard. And so um, the, the case of an individual asking for, for a particular um, level of care not necessarily successful, but the case of um, in relation to antiretroviral drugs for, um, for, for, for babies, for the transfer of HIV between, between mums and babies, the, the Constitutional Court in South Africa said, no, you have to have, have a standard, you have to consider this, you can't say that, that, it, that it's not available in some areas and others. And so what the, the, the international standards say and what the incorporation, particularly of economic social rights, provide is a framework for decision making where you can't challenge necessarily the, the, the outcome, but you can challenge the decision-making process um, and provides for, for the best possible decision within available resources. Okay, I think we're going to move on to a, a new topic. Claire Adams is going to pick that up, but I think you know we could probably talk for a few hours on, on these aspects, um, and we would be very keen if you do have any additional written evidence that you'd want to uh, provide to us, we would be very keen for, for, for both sides of the argument to be presented to, to committee to allow us to um, uh, consider it a bit further. Um, Claire Adamson. Um, thank you, Convener. Um, if I could direct a question initially to, to Alison Bales. Um, 
you publish a Carnegie Endowment for International Peace article in which you wrote, Scotland will be joining a set of nations that have often flourished in modern Europe, so long as they grasp the implication of their status and careful, choice with ch careful choices required. So in, in a general question, and to open up a little bit of the debate about this, what opportunities would a yes vote open up for Scotland so that it could flourish, flourish on the global stage? Well, thank you very much for, for the question. Uh, the reason I stress that point in the article is that small states are extremely diverse. Some of them make very good use of their position in a canny sort of way because, let's be frank, it does give the chance to be a free rider. You escape a lot of the most difficult burdens and decisions of powerful status in the world and you gain the chance to be, for example, a respected uh, mediator, a, a taker of uh, high-minded initiatives. You have a relatively uh, small, limited economy where you can try and bring out your best qualities for international competition, and you have maybe a better chance of popular cohesion behind your policies, uh, although I would stress that... Um, uh, that does not come automatically, and you need just as sophisticated a mechanism for forming policy in a small state as in a large one, because differences that exist can easily become sharper in that they are um, personalised in a small community. So I would say that um, deciding to become a small state, in this case it would be a small state independent for the first time, is only the first step. You then have to say, what kind of small state do you want to be? And what actions are you going to take, I would stress internally as well as externally, uh, to follow that through? Now, um, the Scottish Government, in explaining what kind of small state it would want to be, has given some fairly clear answers. It would be a robust small state in that it would have proportionately sized armed forces and it would be ready to defend itself. It would want to be in NATO where it would actually have to defend its allies as well. An independent Scotland in NATO would be pledged to defend the remaining UK, which is an interesting point. But it would also be a peaceful small state with um, a particular attachment to disarmament, including nuclear disarmament, and it would be one with a kind of global conscience which would engage in uh, peace missions, humanitarian aid, and so on. Um, this is often put forward as a Nordic profile, and I think objectively speaking, those are characteristics typical of the Nordic states, although the individual Nordic profiles vary a lot. I think it's uh, not unrealistic for Scotland to try to assimilate itself to that profile, given not just its size and its traditions and its skills, but also geographical position, which makes it a peripheral and a maritime power. Small peripheral maritime powers actually do have chances for overseas intervention and for very wide global engagement, which perhaps small landlocked small states which are hedged in by big neighbours would find more difficult. Um, not to go on for too long on this, the last point I would like to make is that Scotland would be in an unusual position as a small state breaking out of a large one because the carriers of Scottish policy in this new situation, the diplomats, the soldiers, uh, the international business people, would have a big country background but would be then acting out their role as a small state. And that's a very interesting situation, and it might have both um, negative and positive connotations in terms of Scotland's prospects compared with other small states. The large country experience, I think, would be very helpful in tackling some very tough international problems. I think people internationally would expect Scotland to understand terrorism, given its background, in a way that rather few other states of five million would. On the other hand, would Scotland be able to shake off those aspects of the big country heritage and image that it would want to shake off? I think that uh, there is no automatic answer to that, and that is something that would need careful thinking about uh, in the event of independence. Um, the, the white paper also has a, a, a number of proposals for um, 
how Scotland would do its international engagement about um, embassies and what the core functions would be. Have you any comment to make on the, the sort of five core functions of the embassies as stated in the white paper? Uh, th those seem to me to be straightforward and uh, as a former diplomat myself, I, I see those as, as straightforward and natural. I think the problem which one of my colleagues here today has already raised in evidence is uh, how the resources would be found uh, for maintaining this representation uh, at a suitable level of both numbers and quality in so many different locations when I think it is legally correct that existing British embassies would remain the property of the United Kingdom. Um, I thought that, that I should throw in one point here which may not yet have come up in the discussion, although maybe the Scottish Government has been looking at it, that is that when you are a small state, there are some options for, as it were, diplomatic representation on the cheap. And these are things that are quite normal in, in diplomatic life. Uh, one is that you can share an embassy building with someone else. Uh, here in Reykjavik, the UK shares with Germany, which saves a lot of costs. And Scotland could, of course, share with the remaining UK or with the Nordic country or someone else. Secondly, if you don't want to have full embassy representation, you can set up what is called an interests section in the embassy of another country. And you can have a few of your own staff embedded there to carry out whichever functions you wish. Uh, consular, political, commercial, whatever. Um, thirdly, uh, you can ask another country to look after your citizens from the consular point of view. And EU members are more or less committed to offer each other that kind of help uh, if they are asked, and particularly in an emergency. Um, another point that may not have been discussed is that any country can appoint honorary consuls in a country where it doesn't have an embassy. And I recently read a study of how Liechtenstein, which is really tiny, had persuaded some of its citizens abroad or friendly foreigners to act as honorary consuls and had been very uh, effective in pursuing its commercial and cultural interests and its image building through them, although you could not really expect to use honorary consuls for uh, tougher purposes of, uh, of, of military policy, for example. Yeah. Things um, to what Alison says about what small states can do. I, I agree with, with the, the kind of different approaches that she's outlined, but I just wanted to add in a few of those. One is small states can, can prioritize what they do. Often small states will say, we can't cover everything globally, uh, but we will focus in on a few things. That can also be um, developing economic niches and priorities. Small states often choose also to, to show themselves as a good ally for the security protection, um, which does come with some commitments to that stronger ally, uh, but, but gets the benefits of protection. Some, some small states are um, innovative in terms of their internal organization. So s several s small states don't just have a foreign ministry and a defense ministry. They'll also have a, a trade ministry and a, and a development ministry, sometimes more external ministries than a big state because they know they, they have to do more on whatever priorities they have. Um, and, of course, collective action and um, belonging to international organizations is a, is a key strategy for small states. One thing that small states have that, that um, big sp states often don't is credibility to serve as honest brokers, um, to, to, to lead international organizations or to mediate uh, international conflicts. And they have, they have this credibility in some ways because they're small, because they're not seen as a threat. They're not coming to the table with uh, another agenda. Sometimes they are coming to the uh, table with another agenda, but, but they're often not seen as such. But this kind of soft power or honest broker or credibility is built up over a long time. That, that doesn't just happen on day one uh, just because you're a small state. So small states can do all these things, but, but let me throw something else out here, is that small states can't choose these strategies in isolation. They're part of an international community, and there's from day one, there's all kinds of external expectations on the roles that they can play, the roles that they should play. And so, so back, Christina, back to your 
very broad opening question, what is Scotland's standing in the world? That standing is in part what Scotland makes of it um, and in part on what others outside want Scotland to do. John Ainsley. Uh, yeah, just to follow up on that in terms of the nuclear disarmament and, and, and what's been happening internationally, um, there are quite a lot of examples of smaller states which have played a, a key role. Sorry. Um, sorry, there's, there's various examples of small states that have played a key role in nuclear disarmament, um, New Zealand being one, Ireland being another. And one of the things that, that they've been involved in is creating and sustaining groupings at NPT PrepComs and what working w w with other states. And I think the other uh, key point with, with this in terms of, of, of uh, an independent Scotland's how it could flourish on a global stage, is to consider the impact of an independent Scotland carrying out the nuclear disarmament initiatives that, that are being proposed. Um, our, my own view is that, that Scotland not having nuclear weapons is likely to result in London deciding to scrap its Trident programme. So that has major international implications. The current position is that there is a logjam in nuclear disarmament and there is a great deal of resentment around the world about that. The first resolution by the United Nations General Assembly called for the complete elimination of nuclear weapons. Resolutions saying that have been passed every year. The P5 nuclear weapon states, Russia, America, China, France eh, and Britain, work together to effectively try to block progress on nuclear disarmament. The frustration with that resulted in a series of conferences, the first one hosted by Norway, a NATO member last year, followed up um, by one in Mexico this year, and then there's a third one in Austria later on. The, the, the Mexico conference was attended by 146 nations. It was boycotted by the P5 nuclear weapon states. Now, these countries are coming together saying, we want to see progress on, on nuclear disarmament, and it, uh, under a heading of looking at the humanitarian impact of nuclear weapons. And I think if, if Scotland was independent, pursues its nuclear disarmament policy, yes, there's some resentment to that from some quarters, but also a lot of other states that would welcome it. Um, when South Africa got rid of its nuclear weapons before disarmament, that was then followed up by South Africa playing a, a key international role in nuclear disarmament initiatives. So I, I think that's certainly an example of how a small state can, can play a, a disproportionate role. Thank you. Uh, Colin Fleming. Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, it's not on uh, nuclear weapons um, and the nuclear deterrent as such, but uh, we'll probably come back, back to that later. It's really one, of, one of the points that Alison uh, made and whether Scotland as an independent state is caught between um, having some of the baggage of, of a larger state and trying to find its way as uh, a small state. Um, if I reflect on that in terms of the, the defence section of the, the white paper and um, speeches and declarations by the First Minister and by Angus Robertson. Uh, I think there's much there to, to highlight that Scotland would be, military would be very, very different from that of the, the UK. Uh, and, and that would be very important for Scotland. Um, I think Scotland would be in a position, I don't think it's a, an easy position uh, to transition forces, but it would be in a position that a lot of states, and include the United Kingdom in this, that would be in, that they would have a, a blank canvas to de really decide what is the best military instrument for the 21st century and build that accordingly. That, that's very important. Um, and I think given, given that, Scotland has a chance to find a niche uh, in um, its military uh, affairs and in uh, Alison's discussion of the Nordic region it's quite clear that the Scottish Government sees the strategic gambit to lie in that area and it could carve out a, a niche in there as well as being uh, prepared to be involved in other overseas missions. That would depend on whether it can get rid of the baggage I think depends on lots of things including negotiation uh, and the blueprint that's there in the, the white paper, I think, gives a clear indication of what it would do. What it would be interesting to see is that during negotiations that could be thought out 
further, indeed, the, the White Paper suggests in, uh, that there will be a strategic defence review in 2016. That would be the point to really think what, what does Scotland want to do and how is it going to do it? Uh, and in negotiations with London, and I think in cooperation with London, find, it, find its role in the world. Okay, Alison, did you want to come back on any of those points? I, I might have some comments on the nuclear issue, but as mentioned, you might want to take that again later in the context of Scottish defence policy, as you wish. No, just make your comments. <laughs> We'd be happy to hear your comments. Uh, yes. yes. I, I'm, I'm personally uh, very much engaged on the nuclear disarmament side, but I feel nevertheless that I need to make the point that a small state first works for its own preservation, uh, and that's one of the immutable laws. And in Scotland's case, that is, I assume, what has uh, led the government to say that they would have to be in NATO, or, although we know that, that for many in, in Scotland that was not an easy decision. Uh, Scotland would need the protection of NATO. It would need uh, specifically the protection of the United States, given our ge geographical strategic position in the Atlantic. And it would, of course, need a very intimate defence cooperation with the remainder of the UK. I think what would be very interesting to see is where would the day-by-day -day development of Scottish nuclear policy come between, on the one hand, the very strong impulse uh, to be a non-nuclear, anti-nuclear state uh, for, for reasons of belief and also using the possibility that a small state has to take such ideal positions, and on the other hand, uh, the political deals and compromises that would be necessary uh, to stay within NATO. Um, what I would like to say, though, having raised that point, is that that is not an impossible conundrum to resolve. It is one that Norway, Denmark and Iceland have resolved um, by being non-nuclear states, by saying that they will not accept any nuclear presence on their territory, by supporting the um, strategic concept of NATO, um, which includes nuclear deterrence, but at the same time stressing that NATO has committed itself to a nuclear-free world. And then going on from that, which is what I mean by the day-to-day -day choices, aside from having the sort of large banner of a nuclear-free world, they have used their expertise as technologically developed small states, which actually have a lot of insight into nuclear technology because of having civil nuclear power systems, for example, to take technical initiatives that, that are very important for nuclear disarmament, arms control, uh, monitoring of reductions, uh, technical aspects of non-proliferation and so forth. And although there hasn't been time to investigate this yet, I think that an independent Scotland with its big country heritage would have the opportunity either to invent or to join some extremely important technical initiatives related to nuclear proliferation and disarmament, and indeed to non-proliferation and disarmament in other fields uh, of weapons of mass destruction policy or arms policy in general. Thank you very much, Alison. Jamie McGregor. Uh, uh, thank you. I hope I'm not mixing up the themes here, um, but I think this comes under theme three, my question. Um, what I want to know is uh, who would decide the status of whether the the rest of the UK alone, in the event of a yes vote, uh, will be the continuing state. Uh, if so, Scotland would be considered a new state. Or if both the rest of the UK and Scotland would be continuing states. Because the implication of this appears to be, if only the rest of the UK is deemed the continuing state, then all assets originally belonging to the UK will be transferred to the rest of the UK while Scotland would have to start from scratch. Um, Adam Tompkins. I, think, I, I thought you might say that. I think that's a question for. I think that's a question for. Well, I mean, it's a question for everyone. But the the, the answer to um, the, the answer to the question who would decide is this, this is a matter of international law. It's not up for negotiation. Um, uh, and um, there is a very full um, uh, analysis provided on this question by Professor James Crawford. Um, the Professor of International Law at Cambridge and Professor Alan Boyle, Professor of International Law at Edinburgh. 
um, which was published in full, commissioned by the United Kingdom government and published in full by the United Kingdom government in the first of the UK government's Scotland analysis papers. Uh, and I commend that analysis to everyone uh, on, on the committee. And that, um, uh, um, and that the analysis contained in that um, legal opinion, in terms of its analysis of public international law, um, has never seriously been questioned by anybody. And it is that in the event of a yes vote in September, what that would mean as a matter of international law is that Scotland becomes a new state in international law and the rest of the United Kingdom becomes the continuator state. Why? For a, for a range of reasons. That's what happened in 1922 when the Irish Free State was created. The Irish Free State was a new state in international law and the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Ireland became the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland. Um, uh, that's also what happened when the Soviet Union collapsed. Russia was the continuator state. It's not what happened in uh, Czechoslovakia when the Czech and Slovak republics were both new states and Czechoslovakia was dissolved. Why wouldn't that happen in this instance? Well, it wouldn't happen in this instance for, 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 for a range of reasons. The most important one in my mind is that this is a vote which is taking place only in Scotland. This is a decision in Scotland about whether Scotland should stay in the UK or leave the UK. It's not a decision... Uh, of the UK as to whether the United Kingdom should be dissolved and reconvened, as it were, in two fresh states. Uh, if this was a UK-wide referendum about the future of the Union, then the legal implications of that might be very, very different. But it's not a UK-wide referendum. As we all know, it's a referendum which is taking place, I think the phrase was, made in Scotland. Right? The decision in the referendum is, should Scotland stay in the UK or should Scotland leave the UK? They, the, the international legal status of the UK will be unaffected by the result uh, of the referendum. If there is a no vote, the United Kingdom subsists. If there is a yes vote, the United Kingdom subsists, um, and it, it, albeit tragically, in my mind, uh, without um, Scotland, which plays such a massive role in, uh, in, in, Brit in British life. So um, the... Um, uh, that's, the, that's the position in international law. Now, I, um, I understand that Scottish ministers have said um, that they don't accept that position. I understand that that's, uh, um, that, that that's, the, uh, that's what Scottish ministers have said. But Scottish ministers have not explained in international legal terms the grounds on which they don't uh, accept the position. Um, and, and, and I think that's because there are no grounds on which that position can credibly be challenged as a matter of law. Now, what follows from that is not quite as um, uh, Mr. McGregor said. Um, what follows from that is that the UK's public institutions would automatically become the public institutions of the rest of the UK. So the UK Parliament would become the Parliament of the rest of the UK. The UK Supreme Court would become the Supreme Court of the rest of the UK. Um, and uh, materially to our conversation this morning, as um, Alison said in her first uh, contribution, the UK's uh, diplomatic corps, the UK's embassies, the UK's international relations, uh, and the machinery that delivers all of that would become the diplomatic corps, the embassies, and the, and the international relations of the rest of the UK. Um, uh, so the public institutions of the UK become the public institutions of the rest of the UK. And that isn't a question of political negotiation. This is the point that I think it's very important that people understand. That isn't, that, isn't in, um, that isn't a question to be negotiated in the event of the ESO. That's a matter of law. Uh, what would have to be negotiated in the event of the ESO is the equitable apportionment of the assets and liabilities. And there's a distinction to be borne in mind between institutions on the one hand and assets and liabilities on the other. And the assets and liabilities of the UK would fall to be apportioned equitably between the rest of the UK on the one hand and an independent Scotland uh, on the other. And how that equitable apportionment would be uh, calculated would, would, is, is a matter of politics. It's not a matter of law. It's a matter of politics. There will be a political negotiation. It will be very complex, very difficult, very tense political negotiation. Um, uh, uh, and um, uh, there would inevitably be trade-offs between particular assets and particular liabilities. Um, uh, there has been a lot of confusion about this. It's actually fairly basic uh, in the principles of international law. As I said, it's very clearly and authoritative set out, uh, clearly and authoritatively set out in the legal opinion of Professors Crawford and Boyle. But I'm afraid that the Independence White Paper gets it wrong. As I say in my written evidence, it's paragraph two of my written evidence, um, at page 211 of the White Paper, it is stated, and I quote, that Scotland will be entitled to a fair share of the UK's extensive overseas properties. 
uh, allowing us to use existing premises for some overseas posts, unquote. And as I say, this assertion has no basis in law. The United Kingdom's diplomatic uh, uh, network, its embassies, I think it's 267 embassies, high commissions and consulates in 154 countries around the world, would become the diplomatic mission of the rest of the UK in the event of independence, as the, as the United Kingdom government have correctly stated in their uh, Scotland analysis paper on EU and international issues published in January of this year. Now, that, as, I, as, as I say, that isn't a negotiating position. It's not a matter of politics. It's not a matter of opinion. It's a matter of law. And it's unfortunate, I think, that the um, uh, uh, independence white paper, um, the most important document published in the lifetime of the Scottish government, proceeds on a on an, in, on an inaccurate footing as a matter of international law. Either legal advice wasn't taken or it wasn't understood. Okay, how, how, do, you, how do you answer... Sorry? Yeah, of course, and can, can maybe second. How, how do you answer to Dr Andrew Blick, who's a senior research fellow at the Centre for Political and Constitutional Studies at King's College London, where he said, and I quote, in my view, there is a legal case, a legal case, for saying that the UK is dissolved and that there are two successor states. And that was an appearance before the Foreign Affairs Committee at the House of Commons, 16th of October. Um, how, how do you answer that? Is this a case of um, put two, two lawyers in the one room and we'll get three opinions? I'm not sure if Andrew's a lawyer or not. I don't know. I mean, I've met him before. He's a, a, he's a frequent witness to various um, committees in the, um, in the UK Parliament, including the one that I work for. Um, uh, I, I'm afraid, I think, that in this instance, Dr Blick is profoundly uh, wrong. I think, he's, I think he's mistaken. I think, it, I think, I think there, is no, there, is no, there are no credible legal grounds for believing that in the event of a yes vote, the United Kingdom is dissolved. It's as simple and as straightforward as that. There are no credible legal grounds for believing that in the event of an independence a vote for independence in September, that the United Kingdom is dissolved. OK, well, what about Professor David Schaefer, who's Northwestern University School of Law in Chicago and former US ambassador for war crimes and senior counsel at the US representative, where he uh, said, I'm not going to read the whole quote, and he said, um, let me see, 5.2 million people, the fundamental premise of Scottish independence is to regain the sovereignty of pre-1707. Thus, the breakup should be viewed as two successor states of equal legitimacy, not size, wealth or power, but legitimacy. Yeah. I've read that. Um, you know, it's, a, it's a quote that um, I've seen used in, in numerous occasions, on numerous occasions convene that. And again, I'm afraid if you look at the analysis that's provided by Professors Crawford and Boyle, you'll see that they take pains to look very carefully at this argument, um, uh, at this particular argument, which is that um, the legal effect of a yes vote um, would be that Scotland would be recreated, that Scotland would revert um, to the position that it enjoyed pre-1707 as an independent sovereign nation state. Uh, and they provide pages of analysis as to why that is er er erroneous in law. I, I won't you know, go through that with you now, but the, 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 that, that, that's my answer. I mean, Professor Sheffer, if that's how you pronounce his name, uh, is mistaken in international law. There are no credible legal grounds for believing that um, in uh, the event of a yes vote in September that the United Kingdom would be dissolved. The, the rest of the United Kingdom would be the continuator state as a matter of international law. OK. My, my final go on this one is, is Professor Crawford and, um, and Boyle and their, their um, uh, opinion that you suggest in paragraph one of that, and again in, in, in quotations, in practice Scotland's status in international law and that of the remainder of the UK, our UK, would depend on what arrangements the two governments made between themselves before and after the referendum and on whether other states accepted their position as such matters as continuity and succession. So it is a political... Well, well yeah, no, yeah, convenient. it's a question of international law. Um, and what, what, what does international law say on a question of state succession? International, what international law says on, this, on, a, on, a, on a question of state succession uh, is partly based on uh, established principles of international law, about which Professor Crawford knows more than anybody else on the planet, frankly. Um, that, uh, and it's also based on, 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 on state practice. I think there is no doubt that the United Kingdom's allies will see uh, an independence vote in Scotland uh, as a wholly legitimate creation of a new Scottish state. I don't think anybody who is in favour of independence need have any fear on that score. But at the same time, they will say that the rest of the United Kingdom is the continuated state uh, of, of the United Kingdom. I think that's fairly clear, for example, from the recent interventions of, for example, the Sweden's foreign minister and the president of the United States. Colin Fleming. Um, I'm not going to get drawn into legal uh, discussions. I, I, I'm not a, an international lawyer. Uh, just quickly, I, I don't think that the intervention by the 
uh, President of the United States was particularly, um, I don't think it changed anything really, and I don't think it was that surprising. Um, states generally want the status quo to continue unless it's uh, them that are wanting to change the status quo. Uh, so I don't think that ha ha bears too much. I would just say, and you, you made the point yourself, I think, I'm not going to get a discussion of whether it's right in international law or not, but I, I think you have to remember that uh, in this type of situation and in international politics, international law and international politics uh, can become very murky, and I think politics trumps uh, international law most of the time. And I don't think we can re that can't be out of the equation. So I'm not disagreeing with you, I don't know, but I don't think you can uh, just simply say that politics is not part of it. It will be part of it. It would be part of any negotiation. I, I never have said that politics won't be part of it. I mean, that's, I mean, and, and, but, of course, but I, I hope we would all accept, those of us who are neutral in this debate, those of us who are in favour of independence, and those of us who are opposed to it, we would all accept that whatever political negotiations follow, uh, from a, a, any yes vote in September should take place within a framework of established principles of law. Um, the, 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 and the idea that international power politics should trump the rule of law is one that I would feel very uncomfortable with. I would hope that we could all um, agree uh, that, the, that whatever happens um, to Scotland's constitutional future, with a yes vote or a no vote, it takes place within and according to and subject to a framework of principles of international and constitutional law. Alison Beals. Alison, did you want back in? Well, uh, convener, yes, I wanted to comment on that last quotation that you read out, I, I think from Professor Crawford, uh, about how the international community would be a f in very much influenced by what Scotland and the remaining UK negotiated among themselves. I, I think that's uh, an, an important point, and I, I would like to draw attention to a precedent where the continuated state and a new state or several new states um, negotiated uh, arrangements for their international obligations among themselves, politically, of course, and then that was accepted more or less as a legal fait accompli by the rest of the world. And that was the case of the dissolution of the Soviet Union and the negotiations which then took place among the remaining republics, where the Russian Federation was clearly the, the successor state, or continuator state on how to divide their military assets, uh, which at that time included nuclear weapons. And they negotiated the Treaty of Tashkent, uh, which did leave a proportion of military assets, including nuclear weapons, in the other republics. Uh, but also, interestingly, apportioned among those other republics the international disarmament obligations and arms control transparency obligations of the former Soviet Union. And once those republics had worked it out among themselves, the rest of the world was actually only too glad to accept that deal, bearing in mind that disarmament obligations had been very properly taken care of. Now, my, my point from this is that uh, it seems to me that even if you start from the position that there is one continuator state, should that continuator state and the new state work out themselves legal and institutional fixes, which are designed to protect both sets of interests and to achieve continuity, the precedent is all in favour of the rest of the international community accepting that. And, and to me, in terms of the actual national interest of both sides, that, that may be the, the more encouraging point or, or the point for us to focus on. Rod Campbell. I just wanted to... to just come back slightly on the international law point. Um, Patrick Layden uh, QC gave uh, a view uh, on uh, two successor states uh, in 2012 to uh, uh, the Westminster Parliament, a view which is subsequently changed. But two reasons why he subsequently changed in his written submission to this committee in connection with our European inquiry. One is general acceptance that the rest of the UK will continue as a member state and an in international or general acceptance by the states carries a great deal of weight. And secondly, he would expect internal UK legislation which recognised Scottish independence to make clear that the UK, United Kingdom was continuing and that Scotland was a separate entity. Uh, but he does draw reference there to Crawford Boyle's opinion at paragraph 57.2 says that the attitude of the state concerned has a significant effect on how other states will regard the matter. So it's a slightly circular argument. Um, so uh, I wouldn't necessarily uh, 
want to draw uh, swords with uh, Professor Tompkins, but just to say that there are at least some arguments on the point. Okay, Alec Rowley. No dare to get into a, a, a debate with all these, these experts on international law. I would simply say, however, that you know, at the end of the day, if you have a new state of 5 million people and then a continuing state of 50 odd million people and they can't reach agreement, even, even if you accept that, that argument that it would be politically um, possible for them to reach agreement and other states would then sign up to that. If they can't reach agreement, common sense would tell me that we'd probably fall back on international law at the end of the day. And I think you know, that would be the only point I would, I would make to that. And it's an excellent point well made, because I'm just going to Willie Coffey, who's going to talk about relationships with the RUK. <laughs> Willie Coffey. <laughs> Hi, th thanks, thanks very much, Convener. Just, just to briefly continue this theme, I'm, I'm a wee bit kind of disappointed with the, I think with the, the tone of some of Professor Tompkins' contributions here. It's, it's almost as if there's going to be a great big bun fight and a battle and arguments and disagreements and aggression after independence. That's completely uh, at odds with the, the spirit enshrined in the Edinburgh Agreement, where a yes vote for independence for Scotland will lead to a respectful and understanding negotiating position on behalf of both governments. And I, and I would say to you that, you know, if you're right in what you say about international law, saying that the UK keeps everything and we start from scratch, as my colleague Jamie McGregor suggests here, I would suggest to you that, that that's not how it will play out in practice between two states that will respect each other because of our mutual and shared history. If, if it's not then what's the past 300 years of the Union been about? Has Scotland always been some kind of second fiddle subservient partner in this Union? I thought it was an equal partner partnership we were playing. So I would, rather than that kind of notion that, that one party keeps everything after a divorce, which is not the case, I think both parties will, will respect one another. And as you said yourself, there will be an equitable appointment of all assets and liabilities, and that, that will be ultimately a political decision, I think, between the two countries that emerge. That's the respectful outcome, I think, that, that can and must take place here, convener. Be careful not to talk Scotland down. I mean, we've not played a subservient part. We, we've led, Scotland has led the United Kingdom and, and shown right across the world. So there's a danger here that this is, this is uh, turning into a debate rather than actually an evidence gathering here. Well, when you're getting points like that, Alec, really at the table, you really have to respond to that and defend Scotland, I think. I, I think we, if we have played an equal role in the Union, as you and your, your colleagues would suggest we have done, you play, well, OK, I'm not even going to claim that, I play an equal role in that, to be respectful to everyone here at the table. I, I think we're entitled to expect equanimity and consideration for the, the equal distribution of assets and liabilities after after a yes vote. I think that's the right and proper way to approach it, and that's, that's, that's an approach that I would take from an equal point of view to respect both partners. OK, just be careful we're respecting each other around the table as well, please, if you, if you don't mind. Jamie McGregor and then yeah, Professor right. Tompkins. I, I mean, the point of these sessions is, is for clarification um, of... You know, and to take evidence from these experts who are around the table. It's not about saying what should happen. Okay, Mr Tompkins. Thank you very much. Um, uh, on the Edinburgh Agreement, first, Mr Coffey, um, the, the Edinburgh Agreement commits both sides to respect the outcome of the referendum. If there's a yes vote, um, that Scotland will become an independent state. Uh, if there's a no vote, Scotland won't become an independent state. That's all the Edinburgh Agreement says about respecting the outcome. Uh, of the um, uh, of the referendum, it says absolutely nothing whatsoever about how uh, the very difficult um, process of um, unpicking a 307-year-old union should um, proceed uh, thereafter. Now, I, I have absolutely not said what you have accused me of saying. I have not said that in the event of a yes vote, the rest of the United Kingdom keeps everything. I have made very carefully and clearly uh, a distinction, which is not of my own invention, but which I find in international law, um, which neither of us are the authors of, um, uh, between institutions and, on the one hand and assets and liabilities on the other. And I'm afraid, inconvenient as it might be uh, to some people, 
Uh, it is a matter of international law that in the event of a yes vote, the public institutions of the United Kingdom automatically become the public institutions of the rest of the United Kingdom. And there's nothing any of us can do about that. Um, I have not said that that means that the UK takes everything. On the contrary, I have said on, on the con on the co in terms of building public institutions. In terms of building public, in terms of building public institutions. Excuse me, if we don't have an argument across the table. What, what I want to do is to try and investigate as much as possible. Sorry, a point, a point in order. No, wait, the Alec, witness, the witness finish, has please? given evidence and Alec, I think you should continue to give the evidence. Can you let me finish, please? Can you let me finish, please? What I want to do, and for this committee's purpose, is to investigate how these things would work. Now, we're talking about speaking to experts today. I would want to go to Juliet to give us some of the... the uh, 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 you don't have a point of order, Alec. Yeah, I do, I do. You, uh, you, may, not sorry, like, you may not like the evidence, Julie, but Julie, you can't just cut the evidence off. I can if it's becoming contentious. I'm sorry, Alec. I'm the convener. I can decide. Yes, it is becoming contentious, and I'm not having a Member of Parliament and a witness in, in this situation, so I'm sorry. Julie, could you give us your interpretation of how, um, uh, how states would work as far as when they are negotiating? I'm sorry, Alec. You can't have a point of order, Alec. I'm sorry, we're moving on. You can't just cut somebody off because you don't like the evidence they're given, for goodness sake. I'm not cutting somebody off because you don't like the evidence. The evidence is becoming That's exactly very contentious. what you've just done. The evidence has become contention. I'm sticking to the th themes of this inquiry. Oh. Julie, could you give us your, your yeah, input? Patricia. Convener, I, I've always understood, and I believe I'm correct in my assumption, that the purpose of our committees is to scrutinise what the government is proposing, whether it be in legislation or elsewhere. I thought that was the purpose of today's session, and to take from experts their views and their considered opinions as to what that might be. I have no problem with any of the evidence that's been given by any of the witnesses this morning, but even if I did, I think I would hear it respectfully and consider it when I come to make my deliberations when the committee wants to come to a report. I'm really worried that we're in danger of not doing that today. And I really do think we need to hear what Professor Tompkin had to say and then perhaps move on to the next issue. But what I didn't want was Professor Tompkins and, and, and Willie Coffey arguing across the table. That's what I was stopping, not hearing the evidence, but both were arguing across the table, which is not appropriate. Witness is not appropriate. I interrupted I both of them, Patricia. No. I interrupted both of them. With the greatest respect, Coffey was interrupting the witness giving evidence. I interrupted both That's of what them you should have stopped, not the, not the evidence. Uh, we're going to, I'm going to move on because I think we need to move on and hear from the other witnesses we have in the, the room today. Um, I hope everyone agrees with that and we can move on. Julie, could you give us your, uh, your interpretation of. Um, the relationship that, that, that nations have when they do, you know, in a situation where they're separating and negotiating out. If you could give us your experience on that, I, ho I hope Alison will do the same after you. Okay, so, um, okay, to do that, I, I have to reference this, this debate a bit. Um, I, I think... I think Scotland, in the case of independence, should plan for a whole range of outcomes, whether it's a legal new state or not. There's lots to be negotiated. And I would also say that there's lots of historical precedents of even if it's a new state, and I realize that that has resource implications of what it would get, even if it's a new state, other new states start. Uh, there's, there's lots of uh, historical precedents of new states coming from successor states, building up a foreign policy, building up a role in the world, and I think you know we've mentioned some of the ways that states can do this. Joining international organizations is a key way that small states first, in Allison's terms, seek shelters um, in the international world. It's a way that they would um, start to gain diplomatic influence and, and diplomatic representation. So that's what I would expect successor state or new state, whatever the legal term is, that's what I expect, would expect the first kind of foreign policy steps would be and, and should be. Okay, thank you. Alison, could we draw on your considerable experience um, of, uh, of diplomatic service and how negotiations would go um, and how you would see it going? I actually have a lot of faith in both sides of the, the, the argument, both the RUK and, and the Scottish Government, to, to actually go forward with a very um, decent and respectful... Um, I don't expect it to be an easy negotiation, as Professor Tom can say, but to be, to be respectful. Um, but I know that you've got a lot of experience um, in your diplomatic um, service uh, in these matters, and we could draw on that if you could help us. Yep, yeah, thank you. Well, uh, 
thank you for asking, and I, I speak with due regard for the, the sensitivity of the topic. Uh, obviously, as any citizen of the present UK, I, I would hope for this to be done in a respectful and sensible way, because that in itself would be an excellent example to the rest of Europe and the rest of the world, where some other issues of the potential breakup of national states are, are being handled in a much less constitutional, uh, peaceful and legitimate way. But I would maybe like to turn the, the discussion in a slightly different interest, uh, direction, since we're trying to clarify the issue, and suggest that we look at the interests of those concerned. Because at the moment, people have an interest uh, either in achieving a yes vote or a no vote. On the day after a yes vote were that to happen, everybody's interest would be in adjusting to that new world, uh, which they might love, they might hate, or, or they might find it scary, or they might find it uh, confusing. And it is typical of a small state that it cannot just think of its own interests, which, which I think in this case have been quite clearly defined in, in the uh, ambitions set out by the Scottish Government, but they have to try to get inside the heads of other powers and think about the other powers' interests. And it's quite interesting if we would then think about what are the interests of the RUK on the moment after uh, a yes vote, uh, with all the feelings, the emotions that would be in play at that time. I think that at the first level, there would be an interest in showing grown-up, sensible, peaceful behaviour. Um, but I also think there would be an interest in keeping what you might call the strategic unity of the British Isles, because I cannot see that it would be in the interests of the remainder of the UK to have a weak state on its northern frontier, to have a state that was an international outcast, a state that was not bound by international obligations on very serious issues like fighting terrorism or proliferation or indeed human rights or the respect for contracts. And I would assume that the negotiations would take place, although the emotional side of it might be very difficult, in an atmosphere that reflected those interests of the RUK. And to the extent that that, that interest would exist on the, the RUK side, not to let Scotland become a black hole or a sort of wandering beggar of, of the international community, there would be some corresponding interests among other members of NATO and EU. Uh, for example, I think one can underestimate NATO's interest in keeping the unity of its operational space going through, through the period of, of the breakup of the British Isles, keeping up the unity of deterrence cover and uh, potential to operate across the space which would include Scotland and its waters. So I know this is a very general point, but I hope that it, it, it might also turn our inquiry in an interesting direction that, that maybe has not been sufficiently explored so far. Thank you very much. Any comments or questions on that? Colin? Um, just very briefly, and echo uh, some of Alison's points, really. Um, I think uh, this, the white paper, in terms of the defence section, certainly, it, it does take account of uh, some of the, the issues that might pertain in the event of a yes vote for the, the rest of the United Kingdom. I think it's very, very important that, that if Scotland becomes independent, that it does respect the interests of the rest of the United Kingdom. Um, that's important for Scotland uh, and again, one subject in, in defence, it's important because Scotland will require a close relationship with the rest of the United Kingdom to phase its defence forces. It does not want to be in a position where their, both states are at loggerheads. And I, I, I think on both sides, I, I think having talked about this, uh, these discussions and, and talks in, in London, um, the the debate that's happening in Scotland is not reflected there, and I think there's less understanding of it. And I think there's a need to um, be careful uh, about the interests of both states and respect the interests of, of both states. I have no doubt that uh, in the event of a yes vote, that both states would act uh, responsibly, um, but I think the onus is in Scotland, for some, in some instances, to uh, demonstrate respect for 
the interests of the United Kingdom. It doesn't necessarily have to agree with those interests, and it doesn't necessarily have to be bound by those interests. But, it, but I think just uh, having an approach that is um, collegial is, is the best way forward. Thank you very much. We're, we're sort of a bordering on uh, uh, time up in about 10 minutes. So I just wonder if any of our uh, visitors uh, uh, today have, have got anything that we've not covered that they would wish to add or to uh, clarify or, or expand on um, in these final few minutes. John Ainsley. Hey. Could I say a wee bit about the issue of, of NATO membership on nuclear weapons, which has been made quite a, a big issue? It's, I, I put it in context. Scottish CND's position is we're supporting a yes vote, we support independence, but we're also opposed to membership of, of NATO. H having said that, I, I think the, the, the problems with nuclear weapons and, and NATO are to some extent exaggerated. Um, at the extent to which Washington and London would be absolutely determined that nuclear weapons must stay here, I, I think has, has been exaggerated. History shows a slightly different lesson. Um, John F. Kennedy wasn't keen on, at all on giving Britain Polaris. Carter wasn't keen on giving Britain Trident. The current, the, the recent upgrade deal was, was Bush and Blair in the aftermath of, of the Iran-Iraq war. Uh, even in London, Nick Horton, General Nick Horton, Chief of Defence Staff, gave a speech in December, which was very critical of a lot of the way that defence expenditure was going. He did not say we shouldn't be spending money on Trident, and I'm not sure he will say that, but it's a logical extension of the position he was adopting. Is, so I, I, the, the static position would be that both Washington and London would say you've got to keep nuclear weapons at Faz Lane. But I'm not at all sure as to how robustly held those views are if they were, if they were challenged and, and Scotland held its, held its position. Um, there's a whole range of views within NATO to, to expand on that, but certainly there's, there's other countries. Spain is an interesting example. Spain had a very similar arrangement to Holy Loch until 1979 when the, the American subs left Rota. In 1981, the Spanish parliament had a debate on joining NATO and a condition of winning that vote was that no nuclear weapons were deployed. If that hadn't been there, the Scottish Parliament probably would not have agreed to join NATO. So, and they then joined the, the following year on the basis of not having nuclear weapons deployed. So it's a, um, I think basically there probably would be a starting point of particularly Washington and others wanting to keep the status quo of nuclear weapons deployed in Scotland. If they are... If Scotland was to hold its ground and say, well, we're not having nuclear weapons here, which, as I say, would probably lead to British nuclear disarmament, if the choice that Washington has is either a non-nuclear Scotland is in NATO or a non-nuclear Scotland is not in NATO, Washington would probably prefer we were in it. And that would be a starting point. But I don't know if other folk want to come in on that. Colin Fleming. Yes. Um, I think the, the, we'll come to the, the nuclear question in a minute, I, I don't think that membership for, of NATO for Scotland will be uh, terribly problematic, although I, I, I understand other people have different views. Um, my argument is that there is an open door policy to NATO membership for European states if they meet the criteria. Scotland already meets most of the criteria. Um, neither would Scotland go to the back of the queue to join. Uh, if there are some barriers to membership. One was originally, would Scotland, uh, as John was talking about there, uh, can it be a non-nuclear state have enshrined um, the legality of nuclear weapons in a written constitution and still be part of NATO? Uh, it can, I, I believe, uh, and it has said that it was signed the strategic concept. That is the key to being part of NATO. If it, the Scottish government said, no, we will not sign the strategic concept, then Scotland wouldn't be in NATO, but it, it has. Um, the other is issue, uh, and the main issue, is the nuclear issue. And it's not whether Scotland has nuclear weapons or not. I, I think there'll be a lot of pressure on uh, the rest of the United Kingdom and the United States to not be seen to bully Scotland. But as Alison was pointing out earlier on, I think it's very important for Scotland to respect the interests of the rest of the United Kingdom in this point for, because it will have an impact in all of the negotiations. Now, I, I, I don't think Scotland should be 
forced to keep nuclear weapons against its will. I don't think the United Kingdom will want to have nuclear weapons in what would be a foreign country indefinitely. Uh, and I, but I also don't think it is right, uh, although I, I'm not a supporter of nuclear weapons myself, I don't think it's right, and the White Paper says that, notes this, that it's not the place of the Scottish Government uh, or the Scottish Parliament to uh, force the disarm disarmament of the rest of the United Kingdom. Therefore, I would say membership, there will be discussion over membership, but it would be important for Scotland to give the rest of the United Kingdom the time to decide whether it either wants to continue with a nuclear uh, deterrent or the time to move it. Now, I think the timeline given by the Scottish Government of seven years uh, is possible. The Defence Secretary, Philip Hammond, has said 10 years. I think seven to 10 years is, is possible. Uh, I don't think that that would be... Uh, that, that needs to be dealt with quite quickly. Uh, once it's dealt with, uh, then I don't th see there's many other problems to uh, membership of NATO if that, if that issue is dealt with properly. Okay. Alison Bales. Alison. Uh, thank, thank you, convener. I, I, I agree with the general line of these statements, so I would just like to throw in a couple of facts that might be interesting. If Scotland did, for example, accept a long transitional period before the removal of uh, UK nuclear weapons, it's important to realise that Scotland could nevertheless, from the first day, apply to join the Non-Proliferation Treaty as a non-nuclear state. You are not debarred from non-nuclear status simply because another country has stationed nuclear weapons on your territory. It's the ownership of the weapons which is decisive here. Thus, Germany has always been a non-nuclear state under the NPT, despite at various times having a lot of uh, nuclear stationed uh, weapons. I uh, would also like to, to say quite firmly that there is no uh, connection between membership of NATO and having nuclear weapons on your territory or accepting them on your territory. The majority of today's nuclear, uh, to the majority of today's members of NATO have uh, never had uh, such weapons on their territory. And indeed, in 1997, NATO assured Russia that none of the new members after the Cold War, which includes, by the way, the eastern half of Germany, would have any nuclear objects on their soil. That, that was a limitation that NATO imposed on itself rather than a matter of countries trying to wriggle out from their nuclear ob obligations. So Scotland's position would not be so peculiar in, in NATO terms, and it would be able to declare itself a non-nuclear state with UK nuclear weapons still on its territory. Chris Adamson. Uh, just, just I say, convener, that um, reflecting again on, on the discussions a little bit earlier that um, the, the UN Charter or the, um, the, the, the statutes and frameworks that set up international um, intergovernmental organisations uh, don't generally deal with state succession. That is a matter for international customary law, which has, has, been, has been discussed. But when we discuss um, defence, the, the starting point has to be the, the, the Charter of the, of the UN, which, again, in, in the first line of its preamble, says very clearly that the, the purpose to the, we, the people of the United Nations, determined to save succeeding generations from the scourge of war. The purpose of the international community is, is, is to, to keep peace. And the, um, the Charter of the UN provides, under Article 51, um, a very limited exception in relation to defence, and the NATO is, is set up under that. And Scotland's um, engagement with, with NATO, whether that's as part of the UK or independently in Scotland, we need to take um, our human rights obligations into that. And that includes ensuring that, that any defence personnel are fully trained in, in international humanitarian law and, um, and the laws of armed conflict. And so that obligation resides here in Scotland. Um, and while, while there can be discussions about, about um, how Scotland constructs its defence, though that's not negotiable, is that the obligation to ensure that, that any defence personnel acting at the UK or sort of Scottish level have, have that as their starting point. OK, thank you very much. We're just about out of time, but I want to make sure that uh, all of my colleagues are around the table, and I don't know if you've got any final points, points to add, Professor Tompkins, if you want to add and any of the colleagues around the table, if you want to make any final points. Professor Tompkins. To make one final point, uh, convener, thank you, and that is that the one issue that has not been um, uh, discussed uh, in the uh, conversation this morning, um, uh, which I've enjoyed, and thank you for um, inviting me and allowing me to participate um, for the most part, um, 
uh, is costs. Um, uh, the, 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 the reason why uh, this distinction between institutions and assets and liabilities, which you did not allow me to finish explaining in my uh, earlier response, which was a response uh, to correct the record having my earlier evidence having been misrepresented by a member. Um, uh, the reason why this matters is not because it's an arcane point of international jurisprudence. It's because um, if uh, the white paper is, as I believe it is, wrong to say that Scotland will automatically, an independent Scotland, excuse me, would automatically uh, be entitled to its fair share of UK um, uh, overseas properties, then it's obviously the case that Scotland is, is going to have to uh, develop these uh, networks, develop these properties, find diplomatic staff, train them, pay them, uh, from, its own, from its own resources. And these are part of the um, inevitable uh, start-up costs of an independent Scottish state, which the Independence White Paper famously says uh, nothing about. And I do think that it would be, um, if I may respectfully say so, remiss of a uh, committee such as this, which is charged with the responsibility of safeguarding the public purse, not to consider the cost implications uh, of the um, issues that we've been discussing uh, this morning. Any reason why I needed final comments so we could pick up some things. Sorry, uh, Claire Adams is going to come in first and then Rod. Claire. It, it, it was just in, in relation to the costs um, as, as laid out by Professor Tompkins, but obviously the other side of that is that um, Scotland already pays for the um, its share of the international um, embassies at the moment. And um, actually in the white paper it says that they expect that the international costs for Scotland, as laid out with um, the priority areas at list, would actually be less than its current con contribution to the, the um, um, UK embassies as they stand at the moment. And um, obviously, if the, these embassies no longer also have responsibility for the great work that they do on behalf of Scotland, um, you know, in some terms, you know, their relationship changes as well, and that, that you know, they will they be able to sustain that level of representation and the number of staff and all the rest? And really, would it not just be um, in the best interest of both areas that a negotiation and a sharing of these, these um, assets was, was done in order that they could continue in, um, you know, in following an independent Scotland? Would it, would it be in the best interests of an independent Scotland and the rest of the UK to cooperate fully in the event of Scottish independence, of course it would. Uh, would that happen? Yes, it would. But it would not happen on the unilaterally declared assertions of one party. That's not how negotiations work. Um, I'm sure that um, agreements could be arrived at between Edinburgh and uh, London, between Edinburgh and a range of other foreign capital cities uh, as to the sharing um, of diplomatic premises. But these things don't come free. Um, there would be a fee uh, attached, as there is uh, under the European Union in terms of consular sharing arrangements in the union at the moment for Scotland because we contribute to the current system um, I got told off for speaking across a oh. member so I don't know if I'm uh, is, it, is, it, is it back with me it's back with me sorry um, <laughs> uh, um, so the uh, I have no doubt that, the, that these things could be accommodated I don't know I don't know what the costs are I, I have to say as a citizen I'm disappointed that the Scottish Government have not furnished those costs I think it's their responsibility to do so and I think it's this Parliament's responsibility to keep pressing on that question my sincere apologies for interrupting I, d I didn't mean to do it I was just making the point that we already pay for these the, the, the current system at the moment so my, my, my apologies for interrupting Rod Campbell. No, I'm content to leave it there, convener. I will reflect on something. Patricia. I think Professor Tompkins actually makes a very good point about the costs, and perhaps the committee would wish to write to the Scottish Government and ask for an analysis and breakdown of what it estimates the costs might be. I think it would help to illuminate the debate around these issues. Useful, yeah. useful idea. Any final comments before we Billy Coffey? Thanks very much, Convener. I mean, I think when, when comments are made around the table, I think we're, we're, in, we're entitled to, to respond to those, and particularly the, the comment I was responded to was Jamie's comment about the starting from scratch issue, which, which led to a discussion about what that might mean and so on and so forth. I mean, when you're ultimately talking about a breakup of assets and liabilities, I mean, if one party by law keeps all the assets, then presumably by law that party also keeps all the liabilities and all the debts. So I wonder if that, that's a, a standpoint that members would agree with. It's certainly not a position that I would support. I, I support a position where we both agree a, a, a sensible uh, agreement and carve up 
of all assets and liabilities after independence. But you can't have it both ways. If you're going to keep everything and make Scotland start from scratch, I'm afraid you have to think about keeping all the liabilities and debts that you've accrued on our behalf as well. I think that's something that uh, Patricia is very uh, um, uh, good. Uh, um, lost my words now. Um, <laughs> suggestion. Um, to, to uh, write to the Scottish Government, then there, there's obviously gro no ground there for maybe looking at uh, assets and liabilities as well as, as the costs then. Happy to do that. Thanks. Jamie. Yeah. Uh, Thank you, Convener, for allowing me in. Um, I just want to say <coughs> that uh, I asked, I, in my view, a perfectly legitimate and important question, and, and obviously with respect to Mr Coffey, he has every right to uh, give his opinion on it, um, but also, do any of the witnesses, in my view, have uh, the right to complete their evidence? And I want to make a protest that on this occasion, uh, you stopped the convener, the, uh, a witness in, in, in midstream, from completing his evidence. And I'm glad this is in the public domain today. Yeah, Jamie, absolutely. And we, we obviously have, have nothing to hide in this committee. But what, what there was was a, a, a dual exchange across the table, and that's what I wanted to, to stop. And then when we came to the end of our evidence, that's why I wanted that Professor Tompkins to come back in and finish what he had to say. I was very keen to hear what he had to say as well. But we did have a bit of a spat going on, and we needed to calm that down to move on. OK. Can I uh, take this opportunity to thank everyone who has given evidence at committee today? It's obviously a very... Um, emotional and sparky debate that's going on for everybody, uh, both sides of the argument um, um, on many, many, many topics. Um, if, uh, as I said earlier, if you do have additional information, I know that uh, both sides of the human rights argument would be something I would be very interested in personally, and I think the committee would be. But any of the other arguments we've heard around the table today, if anybody's got anything additional to add, that would be very helpful in our deliber deliberations. And I can thank you all very much. And thank you, Alison, for joining us from Iceland. Uh, <laughs> thank you very, very much, and we, we look forward forward to hearing from you again. Thank you. Um, I believe our next committee meeting is 26, where we'll hear from the Minister, uh, Hamza Yusuf, on all of the topics that we've discussed in our three one-off sessions. Um, and I now close the meeting. Thank you.